let's get into some fringe cutting, shall we? Because fringe really is the ultimate accessory to a haircut. So today we're going to talk about a couple different kinds of fringe. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do some curly haired fringe. Ooh, look at that. So don't worry, my curly haired friends, you will get some love today too. And I'm going to be sipping on coffee because for some reason, I just not want to get out of bed this morning. It is cold, it is gray, and it's rainy outside here in Oregon. So, and it's Monday, Andrew. It's Monday. <laughs> it's Monday, buddy. Right? Everyone say hi to Kurt in the chat. <laughs> All right. So cool to have all you on. And thanks for checking in, saying hello, and letting us know where you're from. Because honestly, that helps us feel like we are less alone out here on our mannequin heads. So um, let's start first with just doing some simple kind of um, swept fringe concepts. Because this is still something that maybe it's not the hottest trend, but it's something that we do so often that we should have really control over it. So when we think about swept fringe, there's a couple things that really with all fringe, we really need to take into consideration. Of course, face shape is huge. Now you can go by kind of face shapes of round, square, triangular, heart-shaped, all those different things. Or you can also just kind of look at balance within the face shape. It was always really difficult for me personally to look at my clients in the mirror and say, oh, you have a round face shape, you have a diamond face shape, all these different things. So really what is very beneficial is put the client just straight towards the mirror, pull the hair back off the face. We look towards the mirror, please come on, cooperate here. Sometimes these mannequin heads, they just have such an attitude. So pull the hair back off the face. <clears throat> and what we want to look for is we want to look for balance side to side, balance top to bottom. There's this thing called the canon, which the canon is the rule of thirds, which is a third from the base of the chin to the bridge of the lip, bridge of the lip to the bridge of the eyebrow, bridge of the eyebrow to the hairline. And we kind of want to see what the balance is top to bottom because that's going to make a big difference of how we place a fringe or what fringe we suggest. Because if they, let's say they kind of have longer space down here. If we come up and we put a super short little fringe on her, that's going to make this area look much more pronounced. So yeah, Kathy, they don't talk back or complain, but they can be kind of stubborn. But um, anyway, so we want to look at that thirds top to bottom. We also want to look at balance side to side. So we all know that we were taught in school that oval is kind of the, what we're looking for. And for the most part, we would tend to agree that a nice kind of slightly taller to the width of the face is what we're trying to create with balance. So when we look side to side, if there's a lot of width here, then we want to start to try to close that down with how we're placing the fringe. If it's the other way, if it's very tall in relationship to the width on the face, putting something that does this on them is going to make it just feel taller and thin, right? So we want to start to open up the face more to create more balance. So we look at it as what do you want to draw attention to? And then what do you maybe want to kind of cover up a bit? And that's how we can look at face shape. Hey, Cassie, good morning. Hey, Adrian. <clears throat> so with swept fringe, if we decide that that's the right kind of shape for our guest in our chair, the next decision is what kind of swept fringe. And a lot of that has to do with hair texture, hair density, hair patterns, fabric we're working with. If they have a finer texture of hair, if they have, um, don't have a lot of density in the hair, then we know from our basics of hair cutting that if we continue to elevate the hair higher and higher and higher, what happens to the density as it falls down? It gets lighter, correct? So if we want a swept fringe and they don't have much density to the hair and we want to give the illusion of more density, we probably want to cut that closer to natural fall. If this is making sense so far, type 
making sense in the chat for me, please. So we're going to start with, let's just start with a simple swept fringe that we would cut that is going to leave a lot of density to the hair. There's a couple ways you can go about this. First way would be to just cut it where it lives. Yeah, Brenda, good, it's making sense. <laughs> just basically cut it where it lives. So we could just simply keep the hair down at natural fall. You could brace it in the comb and just cut a diagonal line to the hair. That is going to definitely give you the most density to the hair. The closer you cut it to natural fall, the more density you're going to preserve. So if we wanna really preserve as much density as possible, we're just gonna drape it into the comb and just really cut a diagonal line into the hair. Really super simple. So this would be for that client that has just super, super baby fine hair that you have to leave as much density as possible. Another way to still keep the elevation low, but to just maybe lighten it up a little bit, create a little bit more movement. Um, <clears throat> Sonia, like I mentioned, um, Kurt, if you want to pop Sonia's uh, question up. So like I mentioned, it really is going to depend on what the balance is within the face shape. So definitely not all fringe suits all face shapes. So a swept fringe, we're gonna look at someone that maybe has a little bit more width to the face, a little more squareness to the face. These diagonal lines tend to create some movement across the, um, draws the eye across the shape of the head. If they have a very tall, thin face shape, Sweat fringe might not necessarily be the best because we're gonna definitely kind of close in one half of the face. It may end up making the face look a little taller, thinner. Now, to that point, this is important. To that point, face shape is only one aspect of if it's suitable to the client. Well, that's weird. Why would you say that? What does that mean? It's only one aspect of it that's suitable to a client because suitability is also about personality. So if the fringe fits the personality, if it fits the lifestyle, if it's the energy of the person, even if it's not a perfect suitability to the actual face shape, to the balance, to our eye, sometimes it still works. So yeah, there's more to it than just balance. So let's say we want to create this um, sweat fringe on someone that maybe they, they do have a finer texture and not as much density, but we still want a little bit more movement to it. So what we can do is we start to introduce some over direction to create some movement to the hair. So we'll still look at that fringe area coming from the high point of the head down into just about that recession area at the face. If they have a wider face shape, you can always slim this section up and we'll go to the opposite side. So we're going to take a diagonal section across to the opposite side. The comb will come in parallel to that section and we're going to over direct the hair to the opposite side of the face. Now, if you look, the hair is coming, some people refer to this as T to the part. Um, I'll grab that in just a second. So um, T to the part, which means that the hair is forming a T with the part. So um, as we over direct, we form a T with the part and then our fingers create also a T with the, with the hair. At this point, if we wanna keep it nice and soft, we can point cut very softly. We're keeping the elevation super, super low so that we maintain density. Take another diagonal section. And we're going to create a stationary guide here on the opposite side. So over direct to that stationary guide, keeping our elevation low. If we wanna keep the ends as solid as possible, you most definitely can blunt cut this. And especially because there is so much over direction to it, 
it's not going to fall super heavy, even if you cut blunt. We'll just continue those diagonal sections, parallel diagonal sections, over direct over to the stationary guide. Truth be told, I didn't probably cut that first guide short enough for much of this hair to actually make it over to the guide. But I'm trying to preserve some length so that we have some length to play with for the next couple examples. There's enough that will get the idea. Probably nothing from this section is going to fit, which is pretty common when we're doing these kind of haircuts, especially on a shorter haircut like this. Over direct over to that stationary guide. Again, because we're trying to leave density, we're going to keep our elevation low and cut to the guide. So what happens is because we've over directed it here, we've created that natural short to long. So because of the over direction, because of the low elevation, we will now have something that feels, in the mannequin head is gonna actually feel kind of heavy because she does have a fair amount of density. So if you imagine this for someone that has finer hair, we're still going to get some movement to the hair, but it's going to leave a lot of density to the hair. So pretty simple, just a stationary guide, diagonal sections, over-directed, keeping the elevation low. Um, so Kurt, go ahead and bring up the question about the cowlick one more time. Peace be with you. I love your screen name. Peace be with you as well, <laughs> my friend. So um, when we're talking about cowlicks and growth patterns, we definitely have a lot of cowlicks and growth patterns in here. So um, kind of two parts of this answer. Number one, if you have a client that's willing to put in the work to break down the growth pattern, then we don't have to worry about them as much because what we've discovered is if we work with the fine teeth of a comb, and if you've seen this before, bear with me, because I know that some of you watch, watch our show pretty often. Uh -uh. But with the fine teeth of the comb, if we really get in there and press this hair out and wrap dry it to side to side with the fine teeth of the comb and just really, really press it out from wet to dry, we can really massage out almost any kind of growth pattern that our guest has. So if they're willing to replicate this kind of blow dry at home, cowlicks aren't as big of a deal to us at that point. If they are not willing to do that, we may want to consider if cutting a fringe is the best thing for a client. Because if they have that big old growth pattern that goes and just explodes you know, and makes all this hair just stick straight out over here, they may want a fringe, but if we give that to them and we haven't consulted properly to really warn them, if you don't blow dry this properly, it's gonna look terrible. They're not gonna like this very much, right? So if you do have someone that has a growth pattern like that, if they're not willing to blow dry it, if they're not okay with the, um, with the time invested into maintaining it, Maybe fringe isn't the right thing. If they do want a fringe, something longer is probably going to be better because having some weight on that cowlick is going to be easier to control than if we go shorter, shorter, shorter. So if we now, let's take this swept fringe concept and let's start to talk about someone that has more medium density hair, something that has a little more a substance to the fabric where we want to start to lighten um, lighten the weight within the hair. This is kind of a fun option, very kind of, you know, similar from the standpoint of technique. Focus, Tamara, what are you doing? There we go. Sorry, I had to get her on my fo focus point, Kurt. <laughs> so, um, we're still going to take the diagonal sections. And what I want you to notice is now we have, this is the Sambia razor, but we have the texturizing blade. This is the six gap blade. So um, if you look, what's really neat about this particular blade 
is there's a little gap right here that holds the hair in place. Then there's an open spot for a blade. So it doesn't take tons and tons of weight from the hair. Or sorry, it doesn't take everything <laughs> as we cut. It takes just pieces. Um, Jaya, so a cowlick, uh, that's kind of the English American term for growth patterns. The It kind of kind of looks like a cow, like one of those big you know, meat cows came up and just licked you. <laughs> I actually don't know if that's where it came from or not, but that's what we'll say. But um, basically, it's just a growth pattern. So we'll take a diagonal section. Now, because we want to get a little bit more softness to it, look how we're elevating the hair. Fingers are going to go vertical. So if we look at what we're going to create here, we're going to create some graduation because we'll be shorter at the bottom to longer at the top because of that vertical finger angle. So the elevation is flat, parallel with the floor. Finger angle is vertical, parallel with the walls. And what we'll do is we'll take that six gap razor and we're just going to stroke on the surface as we slide out. Now what that does is it cre it pulls out just areas of hair. So what we're going to leave ourselves with is something that's quite soft and quite light through those ends. Now I'm keeping the razor pretty parallel with the hair because we're working on dry hair. If we get too strong of an angle, we tend to grab the hair. This is where people get really concerned is they say, well, I was taught that you're never supposed to cut dry hair with a razor. Now, here's the thing is if you cut dry hair with a razor like we're doing right now, you are probably going to create a little bit of roughness in the cuticle. So this person would probably be someone that has hair that we're not concerned about roughing up the cuticle a little bit. So she's not going to have frizzy hair. She's not going to have super curly hair. She's not going to have fine damaged hair. She's going to have medium, pretty healthy hair. <laughs> okay. So don't get stressed out about the razor on dry hair. Penny, uh, I see you. You're freaking out right now, right? <laughs> So we're breaking the law, we're breaking the rules. So you can start to see it definitely keeps a softer edge to it. So again, we're still utilizing a stationary guide, which is right here over the corner of the eyebrow. Elevation is parallel with the floor, finger angle is parallel with the walls. And then we just bring that six gap razor in, keep it pretty parallel to the hair and just stroke gently, very gentle touch, lots of tension with the left hand, but very gentle with the right hand. One more section. And the reason we're doing it this way is so that we create softness and movement within, within this strand of hair. And keep that blade pretty parallel to the hair, really soft, gentle strokes. That stroke is coming more from the wrist and the fingertips, more so than the elbow and the shoulder. So instead of kind of using our razor like this, which kind of creates more choppiness, we're gently stroking the hair away. <laughs> Don't worry, Penny, we got you, friend. So if you look, what ends up happening now is that this just is much, much softer. So this is going to be more appropriate for that client that does have a medium density. She's got some, uh, or he or she, they, are going to have a little bit more strength to the hair, or probably healthier hair, just because it does have some more density to it, some more structure to it. <clears throat> now, one thing you could do too, if you're a little concerned with um, using your razor on dry hair, you can also introduce some spray shine, something that has a slip to it, if you feel like you need it. So, so let's do one more sweat fringe here for you. This one, we'll use a regular pair of shears, but we're going to be 
extra soft with it. So um, we've gone from kind of low elevation, finer hair to now medium and having some more texture and movement to it. Now let's go up even higher and let's really soften this out and give it tons of movement and tons of texture. Exact same principles. Diagonal section. Now we're going to elevate 90 degrees to the scalp. So let's give you a profile view here so you can see that elevation. The finger angle is also going to mirror the scalp. We're going to enter in with a very, very parallel, very deep point cut. So what I mean by parallel is very parallel to the grain of the hair. So the grain of the hair, the point cut is very, very parallel to that. And I'm putting myself in a very awkward position there because I'm trying to give you a light background. Usually, I'm just stand here. But what that does is gives us a really nice layered effect. So um, option number one was pretty close to one length hair. Option number two took us into graduation where we're going to move some of the weight off of the perimeter, but still leave a little bit more weight to the hair. Option number three now is that we are taking the most amount of weight away from the hair because we're working 90 degrees to the scalp. So again, over directing to that stationary guide, we have that stationary guide over top of the left eye, elevating 90 degrees to the shape of the head. You see that elevation there. And then our point cut is very, very parallel to the hair to keep the ends very soft. If you wanted it to be a little more choppy feeling, you definitely could come in a little more diagonal and create more peak and valley sort of texture. That is most definitely an option. But for us today, we're going to keep things super, super soft. Again, another diagonal section across the head. Over direct to that stationary guide, work 90 degrees to the head shape. We're probably gonna start to run out of too much hair to cut because we're getting further and further over and the hair is already pretty short over there. Really soft parallel point cut. One more section. Let's see if we have anything to cut there. We might not. <clears throat> Over direct to that stationary guide. Elevate up 90 degrees to the shape of the head. And those of you that are Redkin trained, you're going to uh, know this elevation as, why am I forgetting the word? <laughs> <laughs> not bevels. Oh my gosh. It'll pop into my head. If you're a Redken artist or a Redken trained hairdresser, pop it into the chat. What is it called when you're 90 degrees to the scalp in Redken terminology? Oh my gosh. I can't remember. I'll... <sighs> we'll get it. Hi, Jake. Blouse. <laughs> yes, blouse. So what we can see is with that higher elevation, we get something super, super soft, super, very lightweight, lots of texture, lots of movement. Now, what's great about this is we have lots of surface movement because we have layers. This is going to be great for clients that want a lot of texture and movement. Here's the big mistake that we make pretty often with these kind of haircuts is that we start so many fringes with this concept of let's cut the perimeter first. So what we often do, good question. I'll get to that in one second. What we often do is we'll cut first down here at one length create something that's very heavy, very solid, then we come back and we try and texturize all the weight back out of it. If you don't want weight in the shape, go back to your principles. If we're doing a haircut that we want to be soft and have some fullness and lightness and movement to it, we cut layers into the hair. So do the same thing in your fringe. So 
if we want that to move and we want it to be light, we're going to cut layers into that fringe first. Then we have the opportunity to definitely come back in and create a lot more texture and movement in there. So question about the texturizing shears. Yes, most definitely a texturizing shear is a brilliant, brilliant option for this kind of haircut. So what that might look like, look like peace be with you is we could work that same exact kind of sectioning. And instead of point cutting, we could use our blending shear to just work that hair away as well. And that's gonna give us a very soft finish to the hair. Um, kind of like that parallel point cut. You could also do that on that lower elevation where we use the razors. You could do a weave cut through with your blending shear. You guys see us do that quite a bit on our shows where we take our section and so that we don't cut everything, we'll take that solid blade at the bottom and we'll weave through the hair first and then cut as we move out. So that as well can be fantastic for creating movement to these fringes. And you'll see Sammy do that back cutting technique. So same kind of principle, we'll do weaved section and then cut and push back. And that kind of builds the shape back in a way that puts small, shorter pieces within this moving short along the opposite side. So it helps to move the hair into place moving across the head. Cool. So if you're learning something, type learn into the chat, please. Penny, you like the weave cut? Sweet. Probably it doesn't hurt your heart as much as watching me, you know, cut that dry hair with the razor. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, Penny. Juman, um, asking about the um, use the razor on dry hair again, we have to just think about the fact that whenever we use the razor on dry hair, we're probably going to rough up the texture a little bit. So um, if you have someone that has super fine or not, sorry, not super fine, super soft hair, and they show you this really highly textured, really kind of almost grungy sort of looking fringe, then that might be a great opportunity for you to use razor on dry hair. Now, if um, if they have a healthy texture of hair, you don't really necessarily have to get too concerned with it, especially because this is the short part of the haircut, right? So it's not like we're going to grow this out to be down to here. So we're not too concerned if we rough up that cuticle a little bit. Jennifer, tips on double cowlicks in the front. Her bangs always split on both sides. So Jennifer, back to the blow drying tip. Really, as far as, here's the thing, cutting cowlicks, you're not gonna cut a cowlick out of the hair. <laughs> you can soften it by maybe adding a little bit of texturizing through it, but really pressing out the hair from wet to dry is the best thing. So from wet hair, you're going to take a fine tooth comb really press out that hair, work it back and forth. <clears throat> you quite literally want the hair to be sopping wet, almost to the point where water is dripping on her forehead. Because we know from school, as soon as the hair dries, the bonds are already starting to form. So if we let those bonds start to form, then we're going to really struggle to get those cowlicks to release. So make sure the hair is sopping wet when you start. From that point, really press that hair out. Use the backbone of the comb to get some tension and really stretch the hair, stretch the hair, and keep moving it back and forth and back and forth as you stretch, following right behind it with the blow dryer. And I should have my nozzle on. <laughs> Thanks, Penny. All right, doing good so far? <clears throat> yes, Teresa, shattering those edges eliminates that bulk, gives it some more lightness and movement to it, for sure. Good, good point, Dory J. Have to cut bangs dry with Calyx. To that point, we would highly recommend that you always cut your fringe dry. This is from experience. I'll tell you a personal story. 
I'm a young apprentice as a hairdresser and I get to cut my first fringe. And um, I started to cut on wet hair, cut it right to where I think it should be, right at her eyebrows. Then I get out my blow dryer and I start blow drying her fringe. She has thick hair. What do you think began to happen, friends? That fringe that was cut at the eyebrow ended up up here. <laughs> and thick and heavy and bulky looking. So yes, good learning opportunity. Never did that again. <laughs> We've all done that, Penny, yes. So we would highly recommend that you cut most fringes dry. <clears throat> Let's jump over to some curly hair. How about that? Because we don't talk about curly hair fringe very often. This is fun. So when we're working with a curly hair guest, a lot of it, of course, depends on what kind of curl. Because we know that curl ranges from very loose, very soft curl, all, all the way to super tight little coils. So um, this is... Uh, mm, this mannequin has kind of medium texture of hair, and we'd say you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being straight, 10, to 10 being the most coily, she's probably got a five, six sort of curl to it. So it's curly, but it's nice big open loop type of curls. So that kind of sets you up. <clears throat> There we go. We are going to grab our slide cutting shear, if I can find it. What did I do with it, Kurt? We are not gonna grab our slide cutting shear because somehow, oh, here it is. It was in my case. It was just tucked down into the pocket. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna grab the slide cutting shear. Now, the reason we're gonna grab the slide cutting shear is the makeup of this particular shear is so that it allows the hair to slip a little bit as we're cutting. Some people call this a dry cutting shear. Some brands will call this type of shear a dry cutting shear because we tend to use these on dry hair pretty often. But the shape of the blade, how it arcs outward of a little bit, what that does is it allows the hair to push as we cut. With curly hair like this, if she is going to wear it curly 90 plus percent of the time, we would recommend that you cut it curly. If she is going to wear her hair both curly and straight, then you may want to, um, you could cut it curly first, then blow dry it out straight to kind of cross check and make sure that it's working. But you wanna make sure that if they're kind of a hybrid hair, um, hybrid with how they wear their hair, that it is going to work straight too. So we're going to assume that our beautiful model here wears her, her hair curly 90% of the time. So we're going to work on it curly. Now, we know what's going to happen if we take this comb and start pulling through the hair. What's going to happen? Frizz. <laughs> and we're going to really have a hard time getting that curl back into the hair. We really want to work with this curl, how it lays. So let's say we just want to create a nice little like open fringe for her. Really, it's just about grabbing a curl at a time. So we grab an actual curl. Now, what we want to do with this slide cutting shear is we want to just kind of create a bit of tension with our finger. Let me get you a little closer here. We're going to create just a little bit of tension with our finger. We're not going to pull the curl straight necessarily, but just hold on to the curl. We're going to place the meat of the shear, that bulk of the shear, right in where we want our short, shortest point. Then we'll start to close. Notice how it kind of pushes the hair a little bit. It doesn't just grab a hold of the hair and, and cut. We want that because we want that softness on the end. One of the things that we say with curly hair is the ends need friends. So what that means is we don't want to create too many little wispy points on the end, but that doesn't mean that we can't bring in texture and movement to the hair. So by 
creating this sort of locked point. Okay, I'll grab that curl, hold onto it nice and tight so that it won't release from my hand, bring the shear in and just gently kind of stroke with that shear to cut away the length. Because I held onto it very tightly, we still have a fairly blunt tip to that piece while it maintains texture. So um, it's really important that again, when we're cutting curly hair, we don't make these ends too fine and frizzy. So this is why people tend to say, don't use a blending shear on curly hair is because typically when we use a blending shear, we end up making the ends pretty sparse if we use the blending shear in a certain manner. So um, can we use a blending shear on curly hair? Most definitely you can. It's just that you must do it in a very specific way. So let's grab the blending shear. This is the signature series reversible blending shear. So um, again, grabbing a hold of that curl and holding on to it, we can gently kind of nibble <laughs> that length away. And again, because we held on to it closely, we're still keeping a little bit of strength to that end. So it's going to give it softness, but because we are holding on to it with our fingers and keeping that curl together and we're not sliding around and moving around, we're not going to create wispy ends. We're going to still leave that curl having some kind of bluntness to the end so that it form, forms a nice curl. What would get us into trouble, let's show what not to do. What would get us into trouble is kind of coming in and doing this kind of stuff where we're not being deliberate about it because that on curly hair, you're leaving lots of little wispy pieces next to each other. So these ends out here, these wispy pieces, they don't have friends next to them. So that is going to create frizz. Make sense? Hope that helps. So that's why it's important to really grab a hold of that curl and hold on to it as we cut. So I'm going to come back to the slide cutting shear. Again, just grab that curl, place it into my fingers, hold on to it really nice and tight. Don't let go. Let the, sh let the shear work. Allow the shear to push the hair around a bit so that we keep it soft. Again, grab that curl. Just be very soft and gentle with the touch. We've had a few people purchase these shears and they'll go, hey, well, it doesn't cut really clean. That, that's kind of the point. <laughs> so if you buy the Artist Series slide cutting shear, know that when you pick up the hair and you cut, it's meant to actually let the hair push a little bit. So when we're cutting that curly fringe, it's really about cutting the hair where it lives. Now, this to me still looks too blocky, too heavy, too kind of uh, one dimensional is a good way to put it. So now let's come in on the surface. And let's create some space. So again, we're gonna grab a few pieces of curl and just work a few pieces off the surface come back into this perimeter and maybe reach in inside, especially the hair that's coming from the underneath in here, that's gonna be a great place to grab and to create some shorter bits because the hair that's kind of here right on the frontal, that's the hair that wants to tend to jump on us. So the hair that's underneath here, because it has more hair laying on top of it, we can reach in here, and we can cut out some shorter pieces and not risk so much of a jump. Plus, that's where we can really release some of that bulky look to the hair. A lot of times we just go to the surface, go to the surface, go to the surface. And really that bulkiness, that heaviness could be coming from the inside of the hair. So by coming in underneath that surface piece and taking away some bits, that gives us the ability to have a much softer, much more lived in, lighter type of look without risking getting those pops through. Cool. <clears throat> Do 
Dory J is saying I flat iron curly Spanish hair and it flat iron the bangs first before I cut them. And that works too. Great idea, Dory. The only challenge with, with that that I might just bring up is if they're going to wear it curly too, we just want to be really cautious with that on how much hair we take away. That's something that, especially if you're working with a fabric pretty often that has that curl to it, you get to a place where you kind of know, okay, here's here's my limits, here are my balance points. So um, um, if you're not used to how much the hair reacts to the way that you cut it, you just wanna be really, really cautious about that. Peace be with you, so you're asking, so no elevation, only free cutting. Um, so you, you can elevate if you want to. Here's the thing. If we take this curl and we grab a hold of it and we hold it in our finger and we lift it up without actually combing it into place, the elevation doesn't actually do a whole lot because once we grab it in our fingers and we're holding it and we bring it up here, that elevation, unless we kind of move the hair, readjust it up to that top point, it's not going to give us as much. Now, the other thing too is if we're trying to keep these ends blunt and I come in, even if I blunt that off, as it falls back down, it's going to soften that end a little bit. So you most definitely can. With curly hair, we're very often looking to keep that density. So um, I'll, I'll kind of just, I'll answer this question maybe more from a sense of just personal preference for me. Most of my curly haired clients that wear fringe, I tended to do this. Um, I don't know. I'll have to ask Sammy too. Tomorrow, maybe I'll try and remember to ask him because he might have a little different take on curly fringe too. So yeah. Cool. Yes, Sammy, like you're kind of eyeing the, the cut. Okay. How we doing out there? We doing good? If you're doing good, just type in good. All right, I think we have time for one more. Oh my gosh, Kurt, you know what? I forgot to plug my, my computer in and I've got like 2% left on my battery. Hold one second, please. Set. We're gonna hold for you, AC. Everyone's having a great time today. So it's all good. Get you plugged in so we don't lose you too quickly today. That would not be good. He's off to the generator. It's right near his outhouse. He lives way out there. Way out there. I see an arm. That's a good sign. I'll team up and let you get ready to go, Andrew. <laughs> yep, we're back on. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. <laughs> Oops. Man, I'm, I didn't know it's not KG. <laughs> Let's get those hamster wheels moving, baby. That, that would have been a really embarrassing moment right there. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, actually, I'm going to save her because I want to I do a short wrench. We've definitely been seeing a lot of these like short, choppy, chewy, and highly textured fringes coming in. So um, let's do one of those. All right. All right, so let's cut some really cute, short, choppy fringe, because it's gonna be fun, I promise. Um, where's my comb? It's right there. How many of you do that as well in the salon? You put your comb everywhere. Sometimes it's in your back pocket, sometimes it's in your front pocket, sometimes it's on your station, sometimes it's in your little cutting bag. Definitely an issue for me. So we're going to start by taking a horizontal section across the front we're going to use a dry cutting clip to just hold this hair back and out of the way. Now we want to use a dry, dry sectioning clip because we don't want to create creases in here. So actually let's do this down the middle so it holds the hair a little bit easier. So with our dry sectioning clip, what we did is there's this little urethane band. Bring it up close. There's this little urethane band in there. So it holds the hair quite softly but securely. 
kind of like Kurt's embrace when he hugs you. It's very soft, but quite secure. And she <laughs> loves it. Oh, 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 oh. All right, so we're going to just take down that first section, bring it a little closer. There we go. Now, really love to use a blending shear for this kind of work because you can create some kind of straighter pieces. Hi, Lynn. You can create some very specific pieces, but with those specific pieces, since the blending shear is such a soft tool, it's not going to leave hard blunt lines. Yes, Sonia, you can do that on medium hair. So um, we'll take the shear and we're going to um, just gently start to remove some pieces. And really, this is all about just kind of planning out where do you want to see peaks? Where do you see valleys? And we want it to be pretty loose. I think we'll do this somewhat asymmetric. But don't be afraid to leave it pretty choppy because one of the things we find is when, when our clients come in and when our clients come in and they ask for this kind of really choppy, really separated, blunt, blunted out fringe, we'll go in and we'll do this very, very soft point cut technique. A super soft point cut is not going to give us what we're looking for. So what I mean by that is we'll say, oh, well, I wanted this super choppy fringe. So we'll just gently, very softly, we'll point cut. That is not going to show up as choppy fringe. It's just not because it's not separated enough. So we need to be willing to get a little bit bolder. And remember, this first section that we're cutting is on the underneath. This is the very first section along the hairline. So we can definitely be a bit more aggressive with this than we might be on the upper surface. So again, just kind of placing a little bluntness, a little more there. We'll change up the angles a little bit. Some are angling in towards the nose, some are angling away from the nose. But you wanna really make sure that you're actually creating some choppiness in here. Cause you can always remove that choppiness. You can always smooth that choppiness out a little bit, but we wanna start with it first. Yes, Lynn, here you go. So um, this is the signature, ser signature Series Reversible Blender. So you can see the teeth on this particular shear are pretty tight together. So this cuts a decent amount of hair with each cut. In comparison, we have the Invisible End. So this is our other blending shear in the Signature Series line. And you can see that the teeth are a little bit further apart, plus this one, the polished blade down here, this is, actually isn't sharp it's polished. So this doesn't cut only the teeth cut. So it removes very, very small amounts of hair. You could do this. If you guys have the invisible end, you can most definitely do this, but you'll notice like you're going to have to cut quite a few times to get that hair to be removed. So just know that yes, you most definitely can do this. The signature series reversible blender, this one with the tighter teeth, just happens to be much better for when we're really starting to want to remove length. And don't be afraid to get in there and, like I said, chop this thing up because that's what she's that's what she's asking for. That's what this particular guest wants is they want that choppiness. And even with like our bobs and things like that that we and our clients will bring us these very, very, choppy, very separated sort of looking haircuts. And we're just so soft and gentle about it that we don't get the effect we're looking for. So um, when they bring you something that has that choppiness, go for it, make it choppy, right? So um, that lays out our first part. Don't do anything else here yet. Don't, don't touch this with your, um, don't soften it out is what I'm looking to try to say and not saying very well. So don't soften this out yet. Take the clip and let's start to introduce more hair. 
Whether you take this into another section or not really has a lot to do with density. And the section size itself also has a lot to do with density. So as we comb that section back in, what we wanna look for is how does that react with the piece underneath? Now, as we kind of tickle the hair, we can actually see those pieces underneath starting to appear. So um, it's a pretty good sign then that we don't need to separate this into another section. If we drop this down and it looks really heavy and you can't see any peekaboo of that hair underneath, then we would want to section into another section. Part of what's happening too is we're getting into the layers on the top of the haircut here. So um, there's just no, this hair up here is not contributing to density down here. Actually, I'm kind of liking how this is looking with these pieces sort of draping under that chop, draping over that choppy piece. So you could always stop there. That'd be fun too. But we're going to take it short because that's what we came to do. So what we want to do is we want to just pick up that next section. So we want to leave that section from underneath out. So we're going to drape the hair into the comb so that we're only addressing the hair that lives on top of the underneath section. Once again, we're going to take the blending shear. So the reason we made this reversible, and I did lose my one finger rest, I apologize, but the reason that we made this reversible is so that you can place that solid blade on the bottom or on the top. Right now, what's important about that is we want the polished blade, or sorry, sorry the solid blade on the bottom, because what happens is as we cut, as I lift that, um, the toothed blade, <laughs> the blade with the teeth out of the hair, it drops the hair back onto the comb. If we go this way with the teeth up, what ends up happening is you close, and then when you open the shear, the hair that you did not cut is still trapped in the teeth. So it's kind of hard to get to again, right? So we're going to just drape that over. And again, we're gonna create a second layer of some bluntness and texture. Now with this one, you may want to be just slightly softer with it, or maybe you don't, because the thing that's going to happen is even though we went really blunt and very deliberate, look at when you start to play with that hair and those two pieces mix together, it doesn't look very blunt, does it? So um, this is really important that you see because it's proof that very often we are not being nearly aggressive enough. Because even as aggressive as I was with that bluntness, look at actually how soft this is. With a little bit of product on there, it's going to be just right for me, but yeah, just gotta take notice. So again, as we go off to this side, we're going to again, pick up just the new section. We're going to let the hair from the bottom drop out drape this into the comb. We're letting it come down to pretty close to natural fall. We may even just wanna kinda of take some length off there. And then again, create some peaks and valleys and some chops, make it go either direction, just kind of visually, however we want that to look. Let that drop off. If you've got a couple of stragglers that are hard to get, just pick those up and nibble those off there with the blending shear. And again, guys, like, look at this. We were so choppy with it, but does it look choppy? Nope. And you know, I really actually like this long piece right here, so we're gonna keep that, because that's just cute, right? Like that asymmetry of open up here, little kick in around the cheekbone there. That's, that's cool. Leave it. <laughs> Last step, just to kind of take a little bit of weight off of it because there's just a bit of heaviness still. We're just going to grab, the, now we're going to grab the Invisiblend. So this is the other blending shear I was telling you about. So the reason we're going to grab this particular shear is that if you look, this blade right here is not actually a blade. It's a polished surface. So don't worry, I'm not going to cut myself. Only the teeth do the cutting. So what happens is as you are closing the shear, the hair is slipping forward on that polished blade. As it slips forward on the polished blade, it's creating these kind of short to long cuts with each tooth. 
so that it's not blunt. The reason we call it the invisible end is because the cuts are invisible and it also makes things more invisible. So the reason this is going to be preferable over in the um, reversible blending shear for this particular movement is all we wanna do is just jump in there and just reduce a little bit of density from the hair. We don't necessarily want to affect the shape. We just want to reduce some density. If I did this exact same movement, actually I'll just do it because I don't mind kind of botching it a little bit. But if we do this exact same thing with the reversible blender, if we place that in and do the exact same thing, it takes quite a bit of hair out. So you can get away with doing that maybe once in there and not having it show up. But if you went back to that same spot again, you would definitely see that. So that's where the invisible end comes in really nice is you can just really melt some of the hair out of the density. And Ooh, I like this. That's cute. So, yeah. Ooh, fun little cringe. I like. <laughs> Kurt likes. If Kurt likes, then we're good. So, if you got something out of today's class, please type bangs or fringe into the chat. Whichever you use in the salon, type it into the chat. Do you use the word bangs or do you use the word fringe? Just out of curiosity. So if you learned something, type bangs or fringe into the chat there for us. If you are looking for shears, we do have 20% off going through the end of December. Yeah, it does kind of have that Mia Farrow look to it for sure. But <clears throat> as always, more education coming to you this week. So tomorrow, Transformation Tuesday, we have a really special one with Sam and myself. We're going to be cutting hair together for 90 minutes. 90 minutes? Yes, 90 minutes. And we're going to be solving the common challenges that we face behind the chair. Then Wellness Wednesday, we have Carlo Novoa and Ashley Mariello joining us on Wellness Wednesday. We're going to be talking about releasing what we no longer need to hold on to anymore, but releasing it with gratitude, with grace, and making space for what's going to come to us 2021. We won't have any education that week of Christmas through the end of the year. Just we know that it's a busy time of year, so we're going to take a little break too. But don't worry, we'll be back in January, like always, with tons of great education for you all. So see you back here tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern for 90 minutes of haircutting with Mr. Sammy and myself. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>